she's very much an artist who works on projects. She's someone who, um, although she, she works in a studio and you know, is there day to day, is essentially who will gather material for works over the course of five, ten years or so, until she has sufficient material which she can then work upon um, in the same way that a painter works with their pigments, to work upon that material, to transform it in some way into the form of the installation which you know, we can then experience. In the 70s, um, when I was making paintings and group events, I realized that I wasn't really seeing things quite the way everybody else seemed to be seeing them. I absolutely loathed uh, life drawing more than anything I can tell you. It was just a hideous experience because I always identified with the model. I never could do that se separation. And I was always able to draw really well if I could be inside. But this thing of looking at something objectively just always disturbed me. And um, it took until the 70s when this kind of point became theorized and I suddenly understood what that was about, then it all came clear. Balthazar's Feast was about people seeing ghostly figures on TV after close down, when we used to have close down. What I felt was that people watch television not for the scheduled broadcasting entirely, but for the kind of haptic pleasure they get from the little bobs of light moving across the screen, which is a kind of primeval thing that our ancestors would have enjoyed in the caves. And that brings with it some kind of idea of the hauntedness of of television and because we have this capacity, which I like to call imagination, although nobody uses that word anymore, um, to make our own pictures out of anything. And that's the hauntedness. As soon as we got, well, actually the telegraph and then the telephone, um, this idea of knowledge at a distance, how could you know something when you weren't there in the place where it was happening? That is extremely interesting. So that hauntedness runs through all our media, television, radio, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I wouldn't divide it between visual and 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 oral myself. That hauntedness underpins, um, I think, what people see as, as as a kind of scary element of some of my work. Yes, it's there, but it's not just there in my work. I mean it's there in those very media. And by evoking some of the histories of those media, I think I can bring it to the surface. November 1976, I was out driving in the countryside with a family friend. Suddenly, I felt the car seemed to take to the air before stopping completely. We were in a lonely lane, staring. If you take Wild Talents, the piece about the children who supposedly have special powers, um, of course, what I've done there has gone directly to mainstream cinema. And it is interesting how, as religion in its um, more traditional guises um, has, seems to have less and less purchase in, in our contemporary life, the cinema plays more and more and more with these ideas of the miraculous and the powers that once were um, attributed to saints, you know, special powers of saints or let's say yoga masters or people of, of this kind of elevated spiritual condition. Now we see this constantly reiterated in cinema. So by taking all those moments out of cinema and juxtaposing them in very particular orders and edit, doing quite a lot of editing and so forth, I'm sort of I think drawing my attention and the viewer's attention to a condition, a contemporary condition in which we know perfectly well how delicious these moments are at the same time that we know that they're created by cinema trickery. I mean, we don't believe when we see them on the screen that we see a child flying. We know that we see a clever filmmaker's 
device for making it appear to us as though a child is flying. Yet, isn't it interesting how easily the fantasies of that as a true condition return? It's possible now to write books about ha the hauntedness of various technologies, and all this time I was trying to work it out for myself. I looked down at my feet and remember the, then they disappeared and I was completely back. Bonjour, mon nom est Christiane et j'aimerais vous parler de deux expériences extrasensorielles qui me sont arrivées. Ah non, ou autres membres de ma famille. En ce instant, la luz du corridor se apagó et la de la habitation provenait ahora d'un rincón. Era muy extraño, parce que ahora había un recodo justo donde antes estaba el pasillo. No quería ir más allá. Intenté con todas mis fuerzas resistir lo que me obligaba a entrarme en la sala. Dios, no quería ver lo que estaba atrás del rincón. The clinic piece is very austere, very difficult. Um, it's basically entirely reliant on the willingness of the viewer to participate and to participate imaginatively. And I think it is basically an extremely ambivalent piece because one of the things you're being asked to to do is to imagine death, but of course, as we know, death is unrepresentable. And this is a piece about the unrepresent unrepresentability of that, and yet we have 200 and something stories of people attempting to tell us what it's like. And I find that an extremely moving, um, extremely fascinating phenomenon that as human beings we will tell stories even if what we're telling the story about is kind of indescribable. So in that sense, that piece is really, um, yeah, it's, it's really a step forward for me. I mean, I don't know if I'll go any further, uh, make any more steps like that, but it's something I've wanted to do for a long time. And um, the space upstairs, of course, is, is perfect mm -hmm. for that piece, and in that sense, it's site specific. I don't think I can do it anywhere else. The weight of the evidence is, is I think, kind of powerful in a way, quite, quite moving. The and that is because of the voice. I think the sense that the testimony you're getting, you're receiving, uh, is coming to you from another individual who is confessing, confiding in you, trusting. In you that experience. One of the things that I was really interested in, in terms of you know the, the, the subject matter, is the fact that these kind of stories exist all over the world, and um, and they 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 come into the cultural patterns, you know, of of the place where they come from. So the stories from Thailand have a Buddhist character and so forth. But these ideas of judgment, being judged, um, being sent back. I mean, these are very ancient, you know, the Tibetan Book of the Dead and the Egyptian Book of the Dead and all those very wonderful Christian medieval manuals, which I only discovered through doing this research because we seem to have lost track of them, which were called things like um, advice to the dying. And, you know, like the Tibetan Book of the Dead would be read to you as you were on your deathbed so that you would be on the straight and narrow after you died and you'd head for the white light and not go in the wrong direction and so forth. <laughs> what I want to emphasize is it is this human commitment to making a story of something. And the fact that things fall into patterns or that people talk about things in, in, in similar ways is because they're telling, trying to make a story of a narrative out of something that isn't temporal that doesn't have a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's like when people tell you their dreams, they always have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Well, of course, it's, you know, the narrative is constructed afterwards. It's no more homogenized than people's dreams. It's no more homogenized than, say, the UFO stories, which also have patterns. I'm suggesting that they have the patterns because these are cultural, um, 
culturally inflected interpretations of non-linear experiences. And people are not all great writers or great storytellers. They do the best they can. And sometimes it comes out in a way that seems absolutely original, and therefore we tend to think it's more sincere than something that's more hackneyed and, you know, cliche doesn't mean that it is. And I don't, I don't judge them. Um, you know, I don't judge them because I'm not interested personally in ascertaining whether they're verifiable or not. And I think that a belief in rationality is a belief system, you know, and um, I'm not interested in opposing one ideology to another. I think to talk about the commodification of spirituality usually comes about through people who would deny that there is such a thing as spirituality. I'm not denying or affirming it. One of the things that interests me about making um, work is that I think that um, an artwork faces, you know, two ways. Obviously, it faces toward the subjectivity of the artist. It has its origins there, but it also faces outward toward the world. And my work, particularly work in the large-scale formats um, that are, dominate this exhibition, those works face very much toward the social world that we live in. So. If, if I'm using UFOs or, or um, puppet shows or um, voices of people who believe they've died and come back to life, that's because those exist in our world, in our social world, as social facts. Any discussion of whether a UFO is real or not gets into a whole lot of metaphysical issues about what reality might be and so forth. I'm telling the viewer that these are accessible topics for an artist to use because they exist in our world. So in that sense, I'm a realist. There is a huge difference between subject matter and content. If you look at, for example, a painting, um, let's say a picture of apples uh, by Cezanne, um, you don't immediately start asking, did Cezanne like apples? What kind of apples were they? Where did he buy the apples? How much did they cost? This is irrelevant. The apples are the subject matter of the work, okay? The work is about something else. Now, of course, on one level, it is about apples, but that isn't the, the real serious thing that it's about. I mean, it's about the process of painting, it's about the effect on the viewer, it's about light, it's about many, many, many other things, composition, form, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. People get diverted by the, um, the subject matter in my work, and then they don't actually deal with the content. Mm -hmm. The content is not as straightforward as it might seem. The subject of what's visible, what is in the field of vision, and what that means has been an, a, a subject of great interest for a number of years. There have been all sorts of ideas about how our evolution as humans has led to the dominance of eyesight and the eye and viewing and how there either is or is not a reciprocity between the viewer and what's seen. This is one of those topics that's debated. In the Magic Lantern piece, the one with the circles, the after images that you see, you know, if you look at the piece with concentration and focus, you see a red circles being projected, you will see a green after that. The green is being produced by your retina. The red is out there, and everyone else is seeing it too, you know. But that relationship between the subjectivity of vision, in this case, the component being the added uh, issues that are brought by the capacity of the eye, the relationship between that which is seen that way and what is seen as a projection, a mechanical projection coming from a machine. And then I equate that with the bursts of sound that have supposedly have the ghost voices in them. Well, I mean, the conclusions are there for the individual viewer to draw, but I certainly think there's a lot to be explored down these, these lines of what is, you know, like, whose movie is it? Where's the movie coming from? And et cetera, et cetera.
we dominate with our eyes, okay? When we look at something, we are dominating it. On the other hand, when we listen to something or when we touch something, we enter into a different kind of a more intimate relationship. Um, hearing seems to penetrate the body. You know, speech comes out of the body. There's a, there's a different relationship between hearing and speech than be, there is between seeing and being seen. Touch obviously is on the very edges of the body. There are, more, there, are, there are different modalities of the senses. So once I realized that this was a, a possibility rather than a problem, I began to experiment with it more. of voice, of course, is fascinating for artists because voice is body. I mean, in the same way that a mark, a mark, the, a mark supposedly represents the authenticity of the artist's so-called handwriting. But voice is voice. Voice is body. And you can play with your voice, you can do lots of things with your voice, but it is always your voice, and it's always identifiable as your voice. And this is a kind of fascinating um, possibility, which many, many, many artists have been working with, and increasingly so. In the 80s and 90s, when the, a lot of the critical discourse was around notions of the body, all this work with voice was left out as though body meant representing the body. But yet the notion of voice and its inextricable bodiliness was never dealt with. Olá, chamo-me Cláudia e tive uma experiência na Porta da Morte quando parei de respirar durante uma gravidez difícil. All of Hiller's work is about this hinting at meaning something, encouraging the mind to make these associative connections um, and within this vitrine, I think we find a range of different histories. We find connections to Susan Hiller's own history as an individual and a history as an artist. In that piece, consciously or unconsciously, I had created a situation where the viewer was um, invited in in, in, in a particular way, I have to talk a little bit here about cinema. You know how in cinema, I'll just use this as a model, I don't mean this literally, but in cinema there's a, a, black, a black line between each frame so that when the, the frames go by quickly, it creates the illusion of unbroken motion, like the old flip books used to do. You all know about the origins of cinema. Okay, well, in, from the Freud Museum, there is a gap or a space between each one of those framed units, between each one of those archeological boxes. So therefore, as the viewer passes from one um, kind of mini world to another, there's this gap. My feeling about it is that this creates for the viewer often, and now for me as a viewer, a kind of unified uh, picture um, the way a film does, because of those physical spaces that have been left there. Sometimes the two the bits of information in the box quite obviously connect to each other, and sometimes they're disconnected. And Hiller is as interested in the disconnections as the connections, because she has often said that it's in the gaps between objects and between objects and reproductions that meanings or new meanings can be created. That's what art does, isn't it? I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it, it takes the shared internalizations of people within a particular society, and artists then find a form for that, and they put it out in the world for other people to see and add their perceptions to. Become, so the work becomes a topic of discourse, and that way things which were not already there to be talked about can be talked about. I mean, it brings into language um, unformed, unformulated meanings, feelings, etc., and puts them out there in the public arena. 
I think, one of the functions of art is to cast suspicion and doubt uh, as to, you know, what is truth, what is truth-telling, what is sincerity. Um, I mean, I think art is sort of epistemological. You know, it's about knowledge. How do you know what you know, et cetera, et cetera. So when I talk about truth-telling in art practice, I think you have to take it as being a little complicated. Um, to try to tell the truth the way you see it might involve you in producing a form of deception. I'm trying to draw a picture of um, how it is, how we are, and how it came to be like that. And, um, you know, I'm only at the sketchbook stage.